Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of the Future Tech Podcast. It's me, Charlie Sell, uh, board director at Major Group and uh, the, the host of Future Tech. So really, really glad to have Belinda Finch with me today. Belinda is the CIO at IFS. Um, and for those that um, may or may not have heard of IFS, a global software company um, provides enterprise software solutions on a single cloud-based platform. Um, Belinda will tell us a bit more about them, but her career especially has been pretty exciting and quite a unique one going through in the worlds of tech and also outside of the career. There's a bit of stories there as well. Um, so without further ado, Belinda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very, very excited to be here. Great. And let's jump straight in. Let's tell us a bit about your story and how you got into technology. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I'm currently, as you said, CIO at IFS. Um, I joined back in November and, uh, well, it's been awesome, really. A whirlwind, don't get me wrong, but it's been uh, been absolutely awesome. So, so just a bit about IFS before I start. So IFS is a billion dollar revenue company. We've got about almost 7,000 employees on all continents. Um, and as you said, we do deliver award-winning enterprise software solutions, and we use embedded digital innovation, and it's all on a single cloud base. And the reason why we do this is to help businesses be their best when it really matters. And our trademark is when it really matters for their moment of service. So it's all about providing the best possible customer service. Um, which is very, very dear to my heart. So I am absolutely delighted to represent IFS and, and the amazing technology that we provide. Fantastic. So as for me, well, OK, let's just go through a bit of my history. And I have to go back to my childhood for this so you can get a bit bit of a picture. Um, so so I my, my career has been mainly consulting and telecommunications, really. So I haven't been at Accenture and Vodafone at three. But my path into technology is quite interesting. So I've always been interested in IT ever since my dad brought back a BBC B computer for myself and my two brothers to play on. And being the eldest, I quickly began to make the BBC B mine. So my two brothers um, uh, didn't particularly have any interest in it, really. I thought that was bizarre, but they were more interested in fighting with each other, to be fair. Um, and I began playing games on it, very basic games, as you can imagine, used to take about six or eight minutes to load, to load up. Um, and uh, so I started playing a game. I started playing this adventure game, um, and uh, it was it was quite basic because if you if you um, uh, failed at a particular level, you went right back to the beginning. There was no saving saving anything. So what I had to do, I had about forty of these A4 pages, sellotape together, and I drew this map so that I knew what to do at, at, at each point as I got through, because I kept on had, kept, kept on going back to the beginning. And, and my dad's actually still got it, um, uh, which is which is amazing. So I, I do need to get that and put it on the wall somewhere because it'd be fascinating to see again. Um, but uh, after I got really into doing that, I decided that I was going to code in basic. There was a magazine that came out at the time which was um, how to code in, in BBC uh, uh, Basic. So I decided to do that. And um, I created this uh, address book. So for some reason, I wanted an address book that I didn't have to write in. So I thought, right, this is gonna be my first project. I must have been about 13, I think, when I was do doing this. And so I coded this address book that was more about um, the aesthetics was brilliant but you know it was very very basic but when you went into the address book i had this rocket that went up the screen really slowly because everything was slow um in, in those days it went up and i i coded it so that it would um sing strawberry fields forever in this very kind of monotone um uh way 
but uh, and I think it was quite easy to code, which is why I chose Strawberry Fields Forever. So that that went up the screen, and then instead of fire coming out out at the bottom, it said a dress book, and then it went into this incredibly basic uh, uh, dress book. So I got really excited by this because it was it was be it was solving a problem as as far as I was concerned. Is is that I had this address book, didn't know where it was, um, so therefore I would do one on the on on the computer. So I, I did computer studies for GCSE, uh, which was, to be honest, mainly word processing and thing, things like that. So I really wanted to take it further so that I could do, do a lot more coding and get into that as a career. Well, we did have a problem. My school didn't offer it at A level. Um, and uh, this because it was quite new at the time. So I ended up lobbying the school. Say I ended up lobbying the school. I sent my parents up to talk to the headmaster and get them to offer it A level. So it did work, um, and I did do it at A level, um, and I was really pleased with myself. Uh, and there was about three or four of us, I think, who who ended up doing the new computer science A level. And I, of course, was the only only female. I do remember there being a sticking point in the fact that um, A level computer science, because it was so new, and I went to a Welsh language school and they hadn't translated um, the A level computer science into Welsh yet. So in my school, it was the first G uh, first A level uh, um, that they offered that they had to teach in English, um, uh, which was for me was absolutely bizarre at the time. Um, but I am really glad, actually, because going on and doing it later, at least it, it was taught in English. So I then I wanted to go on, on to university. And uh, this is where I learned that your parents aren't always right. They are some of the time, but sometimes they get things a bit wrong. And um, so my father, who's a poet, by the way, nothing to do with, with IT, so not really an expert in career advice. But he told me, can't do computer science, Belinda, you are going to be too specialist. You've put yourself into this small, tiny box, not really sure whether computers are going to take on in the, in, in the way that you think that they are. <laughs> um, and you should do something, something broader. Um, so I ended up doing economics instead. Um, so, so I actually got my own back because once I finished my economics degree, uh, lo and behold, I still wanted to do IT. So I went on and I did a master's. Um, and uh, of course, this cost an absolute fortune. I was another another year in 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 university where I was still at home and wasn't wasn't earning full time money. So, uh, so I I think I, yeah I got my own back. But for then, um, uh, I got a job supporting uh, the Bank of England for the Millennium Bug, um, and uh, I was a COBOL programmer. And this, so this was in the late 90s, and I was based in the basement of the Bank of England with about 40 or so men that I can only describe as uh, middle-aged men with beards, woolly jumpers and sandals and socks and and you know i'm generalizing a bit here but uh, but you can you you can imagine i learned more about making making cups of tea than i did about actual actual programming i i was i was the only girl and i was very much the assistant i was very much the person who went off and uh, and made tea and did the photocopying and all all, all of that stuff I was also every time I asked a question about, but why are we doing this? What what what's the business reason? I, I got looked at. Well, we don't know, but you, and and we don't care. Just do your job. So there wasn't at the time there wasn't this this inquisitive of understanding what you were actually doing when you were when you were coding things. It was to totally totally bizarre to me, and I really really wanted to know. So, so at that point, that's when I went into consulting. And, and to be fair, this is exactly where I found my niche spot, which is right between the business and, and technology. And this is where I spent my entire career. And actually, where, where I am now, even as a CIO, I still fight, feel that I am part of the business, right between technology and, uh, and the business. Um, and uh, so I, I worked at KPMG and then I moved to Accenture um, and Accenture was a place where because I was more senior, I really learned about about aligning goals. So the commercial side of an organization and the technology side of an organization, if they had goals that were the same, 
and they were completely aligned, then uh, then they, it worked so much better than having commercial goals and te technology goals, because that's when the fights kind of started. Um, and uh, I then moved over to Vodafone and I focused on uh, transformation there. And again, right between the business and, and uh, technology, I managed large transformation programs, had a massive technical element, but also a big business and people change element as well, culture change. And, and that, that is I'm very passionate about and something that is so important that somebody in IT needs to un, uh, understand. And uh, my last role at three was pretty much the same. So I was a CIO, did, did the transformation. Again, big culture change there, moving, it, moving into the, the digital era. So again, doing, uh, doing IT and doing technology, but also the people impact, the business impact, the commercial, the commercial impact. I was very much uh, an enabler. So enabler of the organization to, to, to move forward. And now I'm here at IFS and I'm trying to instill the same thing here at IFS. Wow. And, and what a journey. And, and, you know, thank you for that openness at the beginning where, you know, from that inquisitive mindset, you, you, you had to really work yourself into yeah. technology, didn't you? It wasn't yeah. just an easy, direct path. And, and it sounds like, as you said, the first role, although gave you an exposure to it, wasn't the right role. And no. so you, you had the but you were brave enough to then keep pushing the envelope and saying, well, what do I want to do? And, and moved into consulting. Yeah. And, and consulting was, consulting is a great grounding point because you do get to go to different clients. You get to go to different industries, but also um, you get to do different types of things. So, so I, I, yes, I did a lot of coding, but I also did business process stuff and requirements gathering and, uh, and that's, so you're much more well-rounded. And, and, and that's when I got to know that actually talking to the commercial side is so important so that you can go and sit with the programmers and say, this is the re this is the problem they want to solve. And then the, the technical uh, team would go, yeah, but if only they change the requirement to this, and then I'd go, right, well, I'll go back and ask them. And, uh, and that's how, that's how it used to be. Yeah. But now a CIO has to be both. So the IT department, you've got to be able to do that because you can't, you can't, it is not technology and the, and, and the commercial side. It's, it, it's, it's all the same thing as far yeah. as I'm concerned, because technology runs everything. It doesn't matter yeah. what business you are. Yeah, totally, totally agree with you on that one. And so moving the conversation on and, and a, a topic when we first met that we were both super passionate about was how we promote STEM um, at that school level. Like you said, when you had to physically go and create an A-level or get the A-level into your school. And you're now at that same crossroads with your own child looking at GCSEs and where, you know, what, what schools have to offer. Talk to me a bit more about how you feel, you know, STEM is being promoted at a young age and what we should be doing more as, as a society, I guess. Yeah, so uh, so I've I've realised this fairly recently, actually. I've, I've always been involved in uh, di diversity. Um, I'm the exec sponsor at IFS. I was the exec sponsor at three um, and uh, same at Vodafone before that. So I've always been um, very, very much involved in uh, in diversity. And I always thought it was a university into first job um, and then keeping women in, in, in an organization. As what I have actually discovered now, and I, I don't know whether this has always been there or whether it, it, it is something new that, that's coming up, because it could be something new that, that's coming up, is that STEM and technology especially is, is still seen as a boy su uh, subject. I'm, to be honest, flabbergasted by that because the problem still exists. It, it, it's like things haven't changed. So my daughter, who is 13, um, is, uh, and she's done it now, so she's cho chosen all of her, her GCSEs. And uh, one, one of the topics of conversation um, was, are you gonna do technology? And um, she's got two CIOs as parents, so you know, you'd think it would it had rubbed her off on her. And she's like, no way, I'm not doing technology. It's, it's, like a, it's a boy subject. And I went, uh, excuse me, <laughs> it's not, I do, I, I, I do that. And I thought, oh God, have we put her off? Right. And actually having two parents in, in IT, two CIOs, really have we, we put her off? But it's got nothing to do with that because talking to her friends, 
they all feel the same that it's the boys that do technology they don't want to have to sit in a class full of full of boys this is this is their their words not mine don't want to sit in the class full of boys i'd much rather do something else like history or um, i'd much rather do physics i'd much rather do do chemistry but technology is still seen as as this this boy subject so i started thinking about this a bit more why is it seen as a boy subject because it so isn't because obviously scholars on her phone all the time so she she is technology is absolutely what drives her life but she doesn't see it like that and i don't think in schools we teach it properly i think we we teach technology at a at a very logical level and and you know we we teach how how uh, technology is used in business we teach how technology um is is changing the world and etc cetera, etc cetera. but we don't talk about the human side and the emotional side of technology and there's so much the, of, of this human touch that you get with technology. You've got AI coming up and that's even more, right? The, the empathy, the human touch, the emotional side of it is incredibly important and schools aren't teaching that. So not only are we alienating girls from doing it because naturally girls are more empathetic than, than, than boys. Um, it's, it's more stark at that age actually than it is, it is older. But um, uh, it, it it just doesn't appeal, and I don't think that we include that type of of empathetic view of technology of, of of how you can have different careers. It's not just about the engineering logical technology side, um, and and I think we need to do to do a lot more than that. And and I just. I don't know what the answer is, but I want to go and talk to the education department and go, guys, help me out here. There is a problem and I don't know what what the solution is. But I, I, I think the way that we teach technology at that young grass grassroots level is not the right way because it is still seen as a very masculine subject. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's so good that you're giving a voice and, and, and we have this platform to be able to really talk about this because it's. It's one of the big things that the STEM Ambassador Association that, that supports this podcast is equally passionate about. It's, it's trying to work with schools and colleges. And 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 I think you've summarised it brilliantly. It's, it's understanding that technology, that there is an empathetic, there's, there's multiple careers within that, that area. Because, again, when we look at STEM and it, it covers science and maths, um, as well as engineering, so people do choose physics or biology or or maths, it's, but the challenge is you can't have the technology part just a stereotypical boys subject or no. or degree educated. It's it, it. We need to really focus on how to open that up. Yeah. Um, and you're right. It, it starts at, at school, educating schools that you know tech today. You go into a tech startup or, or work with. I could imagine working within your business, and you'll have product owners and testers and QAs and. A multitude, UI, UX, people who are passionate about design and creativity that all fit within the technology team. And I was I was trying to describe to my daughter the the even the fashion industry, right? She likes her clothes, so I thought, right, I'll go in with that kind of kind of angle. Even in the fashion industry, there's new and amazing things that 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 they're doing. And and 3D printing clothes is is another thing. That you download something at home and you 3D print your own your own skirt or whatever it is that that, that you want. And her view on that is, yeah, but that's not really technology, is it? It's like what is it then? And that's what schools don't really make these these girls understand that that is technology, and and therefore it is is you've got to have a basic understanding of of technology in order to work in a world work, world like like that. So mm -hmm. so it, it it is very very vast. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, and again, I totally agree with you, and. I know you're also quite keen to just touch on also because it's it's not just about the entry levels into technology, but returning to work as well and the the barriers there. So what have you seen there, and what what can we be doing better to support that part? 
Yeah, so this is something I've always pushed. And I think there is still a huge issue that you get that we, we just need to get to the bottom of it. So if we look at the stats, about 50% of women never return to work. So you can imagine the huge skill loss that you're getting, the enormous impact on the business, on your actual individual business and the overall economy. And the main reason that research has shown that they can see about this is women go off and have children. And by the time they want to return to work, the world has moved on so fast because it does now. Things change in in months rather than years now. And they don't have the confidence to go back to work. Um, and so yeah. I'll give you an example of a, a particular thing that I've I've done myself. So in my in my last role. I had two individuals that wanted to come back to work, both very, very different. One had been off out of the workforce for 10 years, the other around about six years. They both wanted to get back into the tech, tech roles, but they were quite honestly petrified. They were going, oh my God, you all use Teams now. I don't even know how to use it. The way you're working so different uh, and it scares me. I won't know how to fit in anymore. I used to be a developer, but things have moved so fast. I can't back, get back to my old job because I'm just not skilled anymore. And um, that just felt all wrong to me because actually, they they still had all the basic skills no, it, that that wouldn't have changed it's just the confidence has gone down and and so what i did with these women is to bring them back into the workforce and and i gave them time to reestablish themselves uh in work if they needed training we gave them training i think we gave we, they had three months to to establish themselves but they came up to speed a lot quicker than that and and it, it was all about yes new skills and new things in the organization and how people work but also it's it's the confidence thing. It's just going, get in there, don't worry about things too much and build build up your uh, your confidence. And I think it's it's this is the biggest thing for them. It's allowing them to get back with no pressure or stress. They're they're, they're not gonna go back and, uh, and and get sacked immediately because that's what that's the biggest worry is that I'll go back to work and then they'll just fire me because they know I can't do these things any, anymore. So so I think it should be mandatory that every organi organization does some kind of returners to work program um, and and the government should be should be helping out doing a returners to work reskilling uh, and and we need it in the economy. We need skilled skilled individuals and we've got people that are capable of doing it. They're just too scared to come back. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, your your point is so poignant and, and, and relevant to today's world because I, can't, I totally agree with you about that fear of how quickly the world is moving and, mm. and where that puts, you know, uh, yeah, returns to work off. Whereas the reality, actually, we can all get up to speed very, very quickly if we've got the support functions around us and, okay. and that, that skill set never leaves people. The, the ability to adapt, evolve, learn um, and add value, that's, they're the fundamentals, aren't they? Learning the exactly. actual... Exactly. You, can, you can learn all of this new stuff and yes the world is changing at an absolutely rapid rate but you can learn all of that it's yeah. it, it it isn't you just need to have the confidence to put yourself in that in in that position and and work for an organization that will help you build build that confidence yeah. which is important yeah yeah and i think that last point is really really important that the, the organization has to be able to facilitate and give that ability to to thrive don't they yeah. rather than looking for reasons to to not thrive I, exactly I it, it, exactly and so maybe on to the last part of the podcast career advice and then it sounds like you know although a few years away from your daughter but but still in that mindset of um how to you know those first jobbers and for many of our listeners who are you know um at that stage what what one or two bits of advice would you give to our listeners about how to really stand out or get that foot in the door? So um, I think there's two things that I've learned over the years that I wish I'd, have, I'd known right at the beginning. And the first the first one is don't be afraid to be yourself. You it, It's OK to not be like all, all the men in the department. It's OK to actually be you, be authentic you. The authentic me has got myself further than uh, than the me that I was when I started my career, where I used to try and mimic mimic others. 
And actually, I'm more confident, I'm more comfortable actually being me, having taken that mask off. And, and it's so much less stressful as well. And I just wish I'd known that right at the beginning that you don't have to put this mask on at work. You don't have to pretend that, that, that you're somewhere else, that actually being you is the best thing that you can possibly do. Um, and I think the other thing that I really wish that I had been told is having a varied career is great. Experience loads of different things before settling down. Uh, you don't need to work out what you want to do straight away. And when someone asks you, what do you want to be in five years time? God, I used to hate having to answer that question because I, I used to get really worried thinking, uh, I don't really have an answer to this. I just want to enjoy my job and be fulfilled and do the job that I, that, that I can do. I've never really had a plan. And you're always forced to say, where do you see yourself in five years time, Belinda? And the right answer uh, isn't, oh God, I, do you know what? I don't know, I haven't got, got any plans. But the fact is, you don't have to have plans. You don't. I mean, having a happy, fulfilled career is absolutely what you should, should be doing. And, and I think that times have changed so much that even 10 years ago, I would never in a million years have said, do you know what? I would have been a, been a CIO because a CIO 10 years ago was highly technical, very, very isolated, very much on its silo. Whereas now a CIO has to be right at the heart of the business, understand how, how, how everything works. So what I did at the beginning has now helped me get, get, get here now. And, and so, so you can't, th and again, back to this thing, the world is changing so fast. I mean, you know, we, we might be hovering in five years time. No one knows. So, so having that varied variety in your career and doing something and finding something that you really, really enjoy is absolutely great. Don't have a plan. Don't set yourself up for failure and have this flat, this plan that if you don't meet one of your, your own milestones, um, then therefore, oh, you're a failure because you've decided that, that you're a failure. Don't do that to yourself. Be, be open and, and enjoy your career. Yeah. Wow. Both points, super, super valid. And um, yeah, you know, being that authentic self, being yourself and, and embracing the variety that careers can offer you. Um, you know, hopefully for many of our listeners, if they're ever worried that they couldn't have done those two, we've got a living proof here of, of, of you know, someone who walks the walk and, and and embracing it. So, well, look, time has flown by, as always, when there's such passionate topics. So, Belinda, for me, a massive, massive thank you for being a guest on our podcast. My absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. It's been lovely to, to talk to you. Fantastic. And to the listeners, so that's another episode of Future Tech. As many of you know, that's posted on the SEM Ambassador Association platforms, along with the Major Group website. Um, and for everyone listening, thank you. And that's another episode. Bye, everyone.